so today we'll see the two last theoretical sessions of deep generative models, so parts two and three. Um, and it will be intense, so the second part will be a bit shorter than the third part, because the third part, likelihood-based models, includes the very new state-of-the-art generative models based on what's called normalizing flows. So, we'll see first GANs, second part. This won't last one hour, I hope. And then um, we'll see likelihood-based models beginning with the simpler one, which is Pixel CNN, although very powerful, simple but very powerful. And then we'll see normalizing flows, which is a toolbox we'll use for the third type, no, sorry, fourth type and last of uh, generative models called normalizing flows based generative models. So let's begin with this second part, making a quick recap, okay? Previously in DGMs, um, we saw what a generative model is. So let's refresh it a bit after the RNNs week you've had. Um, we have a data set with points X, whatever those Xs are, images, waveforms, I don't care. And I want my model to be able to generate things that resemble those training data points, but not to copy them, right? So regardless of whether it is images or waveforms or words or I don't know, um, remember, we don't memorize. Our model has some random components, some stochasticity out of which it can generate new samples that look like the ones in the training set, but they are not the ones in the training set. So uh, lookup tables don't work here. They are totally forbidden, okay? Memorization is a forbidden keyword. So taxonomy was like this. We can, as we're modeling probability distributions, P of Xs, yeah. Um, we saw the other day we can do it explicitly. So directly modeling log of P of X in our loss function, as we saw with the VAE, variational autoencoders. But we can do it approximately, yeah? So explicitly and implicitly, sorry. And then inside the explicitly, when I have the log P of X in my loss function, it can be approximately with some error that I cannot get rid of it. And it can also be tractable and exact. So I know the exact formulation, okay? So today, we'll go, there you go. We'll first go now into the implicit one, which means I don't have log of p of x or p of x, so I don't have that likelihood formula. Maximizing likelihood is not my formula in the implicitly based. This is generative adversarial networks. We will work with something I will call the mirror effect, okay? You'll see what I call it. It's not something you look into directly, but you have the reflection of it. You see some effect, so you know where that thing comes from, okay? This means you don't know the exact shape of the distribution, but still you'll get the distribution and the samples it gives to you. And then we'll see in the third part, tractable density with likelihood base in two ways. Two ways to model the exact likelihood. First, a slow but very effective way and powerful and simple, which is Pixel CNN, also called WaveNet when we work with audio. And uh, flow-based models, which is very challenging and it's new this year. Last year we just had DGMs one and two. Now we have three because we needed it because of the normalizing flows. So remember variational autoencoder, as I said, we're modeling P of X directly in the loss function. We had some error terms, some reconstruction loss, some rigorization. Regardless of all these terms, we had log P of X in the loss function. Remember, we were explicitly modeling the distribution in the loss, yeah? And we had this sort of architecture with an encoder. It learned to map samples onto a prior distribution, which gives us this random behavior such that when the encoder and decoder learn jointly how to map onto prior. Prior gets the meaning of what your data looks like, and then you map back to the image space, yeah? You can get rid of the encoder. And assuming your encoder did a good job, now you can say, okay, my prior distribution has information on how my image data looks like, so I can just get samples from my simple prior distribution, and I will get cumbersome images, like cats and whatever, yeah? So, this was how uh, we made things work with variational autoencoders, very simplistic, and now GANs come to play with their explosion and revolution. So what are these generative adversarial networks thing? At any moment, if you have any doubt, just stop me, okay? And just ask whatever, because things get more cumbersome, okay? But, but we'll do it pleasantly. So um, first things first, this thing is not that old and actually 2014 was the year where both variational autoencoders and GANs appeared, both, okay, same year. 
um, the first one, variational order encoders, found a way to approximately uh, model the density function with some lower bound and stuff. But Gan said, we will use another clever trick by which we don't care about the shape of that function because it's very complicated. We're modeling images, let's say. How may I model the probability of every pixel? Depending on the resolution, it can get to thousands and thousands and thousands of dimensions. All the dependencies they have, this is very hard. And I don't want to model any sort of error bound, so uh, let's use the power of neural networks to unveil which are those relationships in the data, yeah, and make a learnable loss function where we don't care about the log p of x term. What do I mean? Let's first get into what the abstract proposed in that work, the very original Gantz work. We propose a new framework for estimating generative modeling, model, sorry, via an adversarial process, first keyword, okay, adversarial process, in which we simultaneously train two models. A generative model, so our, our key, key component here, the one we want, that captures the data distribution, what the generative model has to do. And a discriminative model that estimates the probability that a sample came from the training data rather than G. Okay, so the training procedure for G is to maximize the probability of D making a mistake. Discriminative model and generative model both working all together adversarially. Okay, so here's where generative adversarial networks, two networks, comes from. And we will see it's very simple, the schematic itself. But first, let's see what the generator is, how it looks like, okay? Uh, and let's have the variation order encoder in the background with us, okay? Let's recap how it was. So first, as I want to generate samples x hat that follow my probability distribution, which is the model's probability distribution, PG, yeah, and make it close to P data, so the real distribution, we want PG outputs to imitate P data outputs, yeah? What do we input to our model to make up new samples through a neural network? Let's give me an idea. We need something that gives us every time a novel thing in the output. Any idea on what do I need in the input? We need a random component because we need novel samples in the output. Let's say I have, I can sample from a simply, simple prior like the Gaussian distribution, yeah? Every time I sample from Z, which is very simple and I know how to sample, I just map through the very complex neural network and I will get my output X hat, yeah? Here's the random component and the deterministic mapping, but I have a random variable in the output because it's a random input, okay? So this is a generative model already, yeah? This is the generator in the GAN. And then, does this resemble something? Yes. The variation autoencoder, decoder, yeah? We had <coughs> sets from our prior and we had images in our output, yeah? So it looks quite the same, yeah? We may ask ourselves, um, is there something similar like the encoder we had? What, what would you use a neural network encoder for? Anyone can tell me why would you need an encoder? Why, for example, if you work with images, you get a VGG pre-trained and you get the features out of it? Why? What are those features? A very high level representation of your data. A very discriminative one, right? So you want that discriminative power to help you, yeah? Uh, but we don't know yet in what, in what way. Um, but still, we will have very powerful features in the output of our discriminator such that we can do something with them out of the raw data, okay? So, discriminative model will help us to process uh, whatever comes out of the generator or the real data set, yeah? And here is where adversarial learning comes. We use the encoder's abstraction to learn whether the generator made a good job or not to generate real data. Why? Because we have a good encoder that knows with good features how real data looks like real data. So whenever G is giving you an image, you can tell this is not the proper color for a landscape, this is not the shape of a cat head, things like that. Yeah, Because the encoder has a good uh, set of features that can allow you to discriminate that, right? So. Uh, here is the full framework, generative plus adversarial, okay? The two networks will fight against each other, let's say. Adversarial learning is an important keyword to leave a part of the GAN framework. So we have two things, remember, the generative and the adversarial. We can even apply adversarial without generative component. We're not covering it here, but it's, it's a training procedure. 
Another branch that appeared is called adversarial examples. That's to play with robustness of our machine learning uh, problems because you try to trick the models to fail. That's adversarial examples. So this adversarial learning thing opened a full branch, many branches of possibilities. But we're focusing in how we apply this into the generative modeling. Okay, this is the GANs. GANs is generative and adversarial. So G, it will try to make so good samples that D will not tell whether those are real or not. It will fail. It will just toss a coin in the end of the day if the generator is a good generator such that the discriminator will say, I don't know. Is this real? I don't know. And the D discriminator will basically tell whether that is real or not. And it has to do a great job, okay? So it has to be a good discriminator. We'll see now why, okay? And I will try to break some uh, fail, fake uh, assumptions that we make on how do we train these things by impeding someone's learning? We don't have to do that. We'll see what I mean, okay? We we'll have to maintain something called equilibria. We will see. But first, this is the full framework, schematized, yeah? Such that we have our real world images, we sample from it, we have our generator that goes from Z to some things random at the very beginning, yeah? And during training, the discriminator will be saying, you're real, you're fake, you're real, you're fake, to every input it, it is seeing, yeah? And it will be trained such that whenever a generator sample is in the input, it will say fake. Whenever it is a real input, it will say true. And when the generator has to be trained, yeah, it will tune its weights, just the generator weights, such that it will make D say, I am real. Now we will see the three batch update process, okay, to make things clear. Here you, you have just some notation. I will leave this behind. But you have to see this is the discriminator objective is about classifying real data as ones, fake data as zeros. It's log loss just binary classifier and generator has to make D say one that's simple okay so let's see it in the very simple schematic like this pick a sample so to train we're in batch training okay so as this is more close to you for like the every experimental thing you may do you have trained with mini batches potentially and you know what this more like this language is about rather than the cumbersome equation for example so um, let's say you have your data and you sample some images from your data set and you forward that through the discriminator as a regular classifier, like a VGG yeah, network. So it will say one, you train it to say one with that batch of data. Then you sample Z, a random Z batch. So every time you sample Z, it's not a data set of pre-sampled Z vectors. It's actually saying, NumPy, give me a random batch of this amount of samples, let's say 100 vectors of 100 dimensions, for example, yeah? So we will have here 100 vectors of 100 dimensions, so a mini batch of 100 vectors of random noise. And we will forward that, and we will get X hat, which is noise, it's rubbish at the very beginning of G because it, it, it's run, its uh, weights are random, right? So it will be noise, image of noise, but that will be injected into D, and it will have to say this is zero. Look at this backprop arrow here, the red one. This means I'm updating weights, but flow doesn't go farther than x hat. It's just concentrated in D. Just the discriminator is updated, okay? Third batch. Out of the same samples that we had x hat, now we freeze these weights that we trained, yeah, to classify fake, and we just update weights of G by running the loss function of D saying, say one, okay? What this is doing is, D is training itself to detect what's real and what's fake. In the third batch, G is running again the D loss, but without updating D, it's updating its own weights that were frozen at the very beginning to make D fail, okay? So D is not aware of the changes of G, but the generator knows what information the gradients contain to make proper changes to the weights. So this red arrow is giving G some directions of changes of the weights, yeah, by which its data will become more realistic. So uh, this is the algorithmic part of it. I will just um, go quick over this because I know it's quite uh, cumbersome, but you have to see something in the original proposed algorithm, yeah, that's important to capture for you on how this equilibria works, okay? So first, 
look at this update. So this same thing I'm doing here, batch update is algorithmically written here. So the blue part is discriminator update, yeah? Both losses for one mini batch of Zs and Xs, yeah? And the red part is the update, the third update, yeah? So the first one, see that there's a 4K steps, yeah? Do these updates. And the second one is just one update. Y is the updated potentially more times than G. So it's a hyperparameter, it's a K that we specify. It can be one, but it can be two, three, five, ten, yeah? Why would we do so? What would it mean that the discriminator is training K times and G just one time? It would mean D has more opportunities to learn better and better and better features before going to the G's update. So this means we want a powerful discriminator. We want a powerful discriminator, okay? Although they're competing against each other, you may think that G will lose, yeah? Uh, that D will just reject all the samples from G, yeah? And G will not learn at all, but no. The thing is we want good features to be recognized by the discriminator, yeah? Because we want a strong discriminator. And why is that? Because as you see, here is an example with a 1D, yeah? Uh, learning of mapping Zs, oops. Well, Zs down here to Xs up here. So these arrows, these arrows here, oh, damn it, are, are basically mapping our Z samples into the X distribution, where Z can be, for example, it's a uniform distribution. You see they depart from all like equally spaced places, and they go to some concentration, which is uh, the green one. We want the green bell to be like our real data, which is the black dots, yeah? Uh, ignore the blue thing, is the discriminator decision boundary, it doesn't matter. But what you see is that by actually playing this two-part game, the discriminator is getting, well, let's say, a better decision boundary because the blue thing is moving, yeah? And that makes the green thing move because it is being trained to overcome D. So, G is motivated to do a better job, so to be a better generator, such that discriminator loses, okay? This, is, this competition makes both stronger. It is you, if you are competing with someone and you are all time like getting better than the other one, and the other one gets better than you. This competition is making our generator be so, be so good in mapping just noise, which is nonsense, to something realistic resembling our data set, yeah? And where does the information actually come from for G to say, hey, I want to make this Z vector into a cat because of this link here, the back propagation link that comes from the discriminator, yeah? As I said, mirror effect I said before. What is the mirror effect in this case? I said here, in this square here, where I have the Ewok and the drawing, yeah? Here, I don't have a loss function. My loss function is here in the end, but the discriminator knows what features are good. So in the back propagation, yeah? The generator will get that information through gradients on how to fool the discriminator, being better and better. So by seeing indirectly like this, the data, so the real data is here, but this link is like a reflection of what's the real data comes from the discriminator signals. This is like the mirror effect. We don't know a loss function here, but the clues given by the discriminator are enough for the generator to be better and better, more realistic, okay? So this is, the, this is the analogy I'm going to show you, which is the, fun, the funny one, that Goodfellow, the author, proposed the very first time. So we always teach it like this, because it, it's very intuitive. So this adversarial uh, training analogy is about having a generator, which is a counterfeiter, someone that makes fake money, and a policeman that tries to detect whether that is fraud or not, yeah? So uh, D is trained, so the policeman knows how uh, fake money looks like, right? But as every day th there are better tricks to fake better and better the money, the policeman has to learn more and more details about the money such that it is not, he or she is not tricked into saying, oh, this is real money. So the thing is, um, D is trained to detect that fraud. And as back propagation goes from the discriminator part to the generator part, I said the red arrow, yeah? There happens to be information leaking about the requirements for the banknotes to, <coughs> sorry, to look realistic. Because the discriminator is a good encoder by saying these are good features, these are not good features. So G in the gradient backpropagation is being contaminated by that information. Because you know, this red arrow has all this information on how to correct your weights to get better in this output. If this is frozen, the thing that changes still is contaminated by these decisions because it's part of the inference, 
yeah, in my backprop. So um, this makes G perform small corrections, batch by batch, yeah, like going with a little arrow through the surface, by slowly converging into something more and more realistic, okay? More and more realistic. So this is why GANs, as they work with this mechanism of continuous leak of information, they don't work with something like words, with discrete distributions, okay? So here, this ewok and cat and whatever here, they cannot be to word tokens, for example. They cannot be discrete because there's no, no sense of saying, I go from the word, let's say, uh, circle to the word square slightly. We go suddenly jumping in a discrete space, right? So it's not fitting discrete distributions, okay? Generative adversarial networks are for continuous data, like real valued images, waveforms, things like this. Embeddings, we can predict word embeddings though, but not word one hot codes, okay? So now the analogy is like this. Let's say, I always say, imagine this is the process, the adversarial process by which we have this generator and this discriminator, and an example, a training, a training process could happen to be like this if the, the counterfeiter just draws 100 over a blank paper and it says these 100 euros, you say yes, of course, yeah, sure. This is not 100 euros because, for, for example, policeman gets the most obvious thing. This is not even green color, okay? Then that green color is a key feature that the discriminator detected. That gets back propagated. And then next batch, generator can correct that it learns that green color fits for this sort of banknote. So there is no watermark now. The discriminator has given an extra clue. The gradients update such that you give watermarks to your banknotes. It should be rounded, so let's make it rounded, and so on. After many iterations, clues will be leaking more and more whenever the discriminator is good enough. If the discriminator doesn't know whether that should be green or there should be watermark or it should be, it wouldn't work. Okay, so keep that in mind, because many people say, okay, I will make a more a sillier discriminator and then uh, training will go longer. No, this is not a good sense of it, okay? You have to equilibrate both networks. And what do I mean by equilibrate? You have to make both losses, neither of them go to zero, ever. So you have to equilibrate them by never going to zero for any of them, but you don't have to make them sillier either, okay? You have to maintain an equilibrium with different techniques. But making a shallower network here and deeper there doesn't work, okay? Just keep this message in mind. You want a good discriminator and also a good generator because if they're good enough, both of them, to detect good patterns and to replicate good patterns and they iterate long enough and you have enough data in your data set, then they will do marvelous things. But you need data, you need good structures, yeah? And you need enough time, that's it. Bad thing about generative adversarial networks, how do we measure this good thing, this good quality? We don't have a clear way to do so. We do it qualitatively so that we make subjective tests with people. We look at samples during training. So during training, we have some randomly sampled sets and we say, oh, these images look more realistic and so we can stop training or not, okay? This is not a good thing, but this is how it works at the moment. Or we could use auxiliary discriminators, so some external pre-trained classifiers that give us some auxiliary scores. Like, let's say, I'm generating dogs, give me a probability with a binary classified pre-trained network of this being a dog or not, you know, and you get a validation curve, something like that. This is the things we can do, but we don't have a likelihood measurement, which means we don't know how well our network fitted the real data set. That would be a likelihood measurement. That's variational encoder had that, log p of x. We knew it, we quantized it in the loss function. Here we don't have it. It's, it's a, pro a problem in GANs, but still they are very effective in what they generate. Additionally, rather than only having noise, we can also have some conditioning, a deterministic code. We have another encoder for text, let's say. We have here a Z noise, and we get some waveform in the output, let's say, or some image. That's basically the description of the text. This is from a caption to the image or from text to speech, okay? We can do that. And this is conditional GANs. There are many ways in which we can combine this C with Zs, yeah? But importantly, and this is like collected in this reference I'm giving to you here. But importantly, look at how C goes to both G and D, okay? Both need 
the reference of what are you conditioned on because what if you just give the seed to the generator well it will have some codes that it can just ignore because for it has to go randomly to some samples in the data set because the discriminator is just saying this is real or this is fake with random images but if you give both the conditioning the discriminator is also partitioning the space of decisions by saying it's not only about an image is an image condition on a label, so it should match the label. So if I have a label of a dog, I need an image of a dog. It's not I just need a real image, yeah? So you have to give the conditioning to both networks to be aware within the adversarial training. Remember, every clue the discriminator has is better for the generator to be better, to be more realistic. That's it, okay? So. Uh, don't give just information to G, give it to D, because it needs to extract better and better clues, always. We can condition either labels, as I said, dog, cat, whatever, generate an image of this, text, like from a description to an image, uh, speech, we done this, we worked, I worked with generative adversarial networks to go from speech to speech, like to enhance speech, to convert speech from someone to another one, things like this. So we can work with different things whenever we have an encoder. We have neural networks for everything. So we can just place a deep structure that goes end to end by saying, regardless of having a label or text or voice, I have some network that can consume it with specific structure. Let's say I have a convolutional network, a recurrent network, anything that gives me a good hidden representation and can be trained within the full loop. So end to end. So this is very good because we can train from raw data, good representations, and generate even better representations. So it's nice because with neural nets, we can make like a pipeline of many sorts of data, yeah, and generate really high dimensional data thanks to the adversarial learning process, yeah? So we just have to have some neural module that encodes the data for us. That's, that's the simple message. And now you may wonder, what is that for? What is that for? Anyone can tell? Why do I need that? Just say, please. Yeah? Okay, exactly. Otherwise, it could just memorize. It's a deterministic code C goes to certain output. It's the random component that we need to make it generative. So, if I have the label dog, I want to generate an image of a dog, I have one Z is one dog. Another Z is another dog. Still is a dog, but a different dog. You see? Or maybe the same dog with a different pose or different lighting in the image. So what this is telling you is Z captures latent features in the backpropagation, yeah? Its dimension of the Z space has a meaning for the output, of course. So maybe it is lighting in the image, it is posed, it is the type of thing, it is a smile, it is sad, it is the color of hair, skin, whatever, yeah? So Z captures the let's say, stochastic components, the variability that our data set has, and C is our deterministic thing that we know about, yeah? We know we want a dog, but how is that dog generated? Let's, let's leave it to the network. It's a generative model, just give me a dog. Or you can be more precise and tell it, the dog is sitting next to the door, whatever, with the text, and the better the conditioning, the, the more conditioned your image is, but still, there are random components you cannot control because you don't describe every pixel in your image, right, with your text. So that thing is left to the Z, Z code, but it's important to have it. This is what it makes it generative, remember. Otherwise, it, will not, it would not be generative. So without Z, you can do adversarial learning, but not generative adversarial learning, okay? And Z is not the only way to have stochastic component. Keep this in mind. You can make it in other ways. For example, you learned about dropout, hopefully, right? Dropout is for training. You deactivate some neurons in training. That makes different paths. But during testing, things are left like, so connections are all active. What if in test, you activate dropout again? You would get every time a different subnetwork, right? That's also random paths chosen randomly by tossing a coin. You can make dropout during test. That's another stochastic source. You can then not use that, just drop out during test. But have some stochasticity in your network. Otherwise, it's not generative, OK? Where's the downside to GANs? We have to keep the equilibrium. Some of you asked already. Yes, these are unstable. These have many times, uh, at least, Two years ago, I would say most of your trainings would fail, most of your trainings,
because either one of the networks would go to zero in the loss function and then learning would be stuck, okay? Because remember, you have a binary classifier in your output. If it's too good, if it's too confident, there's a sigmoid function that vanishes the gradient, learning is stuck, yeah? So um, there are other problems, actually, not only D being overconfident and having loss zero, you can oscillate between solutions because of the, formu the iterative formulation, Etc. Etc. The thing is, after many pain, yeah, much pain. Sorry, uh, from the community, we have some hacks on how to make at least the vanilla vanilla gun is the one that has just a binary classifier with the binary cross entropy in the discriminator. These hacks are collected into. Sumit Chintala is a very famous researcher in Facebook research, and he made many many things with guns. He invented new types of guns actually. And in Facebook research, they, they do plenty of stuff with, with GANs, as in Google and OpenAI. So the thing is, um, they made this repo, uh, Sumit, and some experts gathered information on what to, so if I open it, you'll see. Basically, here is a readme with like, what sort of prior would you use, how to mix batch organization or not, soft or noisy labels, uh, this sort of architecture, if you have labels, use them, this sort of clues, okay? But other than that, this works for vanilla GAN, for the binary classifier. You also have different loss functions. Things evolved. We're not just in vanilla GAN uh, only, okay, nowadays. We also have, rather than binary, binary cross-entropy, we also have least squares GAN, which is changing the loss function, getting rid of the sigmoid to avoid vanishing gradients. We have Wasserstein GAN with some gradient penalty, which ensures something called Lipschitz one condition that basically makes your gradient not explode in any of the transitions. Um, energy base with boundary equilibrium, whatever. So uh, we, you have many options. And here I leave some references, OK? But the thing is, uh, the, only, the ones we used are the simpler ones. I used Wasserstein with gradient penalty. List the squares a lot, because it's very easy. You, here, in list the squares, you just get rid of the sigmoid, and you put a, a mean square error loss with the binary code. So you have the same network. You just get rid of the sigmoid. You put a distance measure in the output, and that's it and you have already at least the squares GAN, okay? By just changing the discriminator output and the loss function from binary cross entropy to MSE. MSE. Uh, and this works pretty well, still has some flaws. Uh, you can then go to WGAN, GP, etc. I tried WGAN, GP, as I was saying, LS GAN and vanilla GAN and maximum margin one. Um, I always normally stick to LS GAN, it works already fair enough. Gradients don't vanish easily. Um, but I also tried this one being very effective. Um, but you have here some links if you want to explore uh, further formulation for GANs. But I recommend you, you could try either vanilla one, which is the normal implementations for new GANs. Like they try to make better architectures and better synergies between G and D with vanilla GAN normally. And maybe they train some extra loss function like Wasserstein or whatever to compare what's the performance, okay? But normally you will train with vanilla and try LS GAN, I would recommend, especially with something called uh, spectral normalization, which is a very new technique, which is state of the art, and it makes your things very stable. Um, a very important thing that we have seen, we're going from Z to Xs, Z to Xs, so from noise to images or waveforms or so something meaningful, but how do we extract Zs from Xs? So how do we go the other way around? Why would we be interested to do so in any case? Well, variation order encoders do it already because we train the encoder that goes from Xs to Zs, right? In this case, why would we like Zs out of uh, Xs? Well, because basically this G2X is a simplification way on projecting our data into something we control very well and we can extract which are the latent factors learned by our GAN. So if there's lighting, pose, uh, whatever, random factors that are being learned, like latent factors, we would like to unveil them and control them, such that in our generation, it's not just about giving a label. What if I know which dimensions of Z learned how the dog was posing or where the dog was in the picture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can discover that by either doing gradient descent by freezing the network and having a Z and doing backpropagation to optimize the Z that matches better the X once the generator is trained. I don't know if you're understanding this, but this is 
something typical to do is, which is the input that better matches my network output that I know, I know the output, by freezing the weights. So the only thing I'm changing is the Z. I'm basically iterating until I look, I get the best Z. That's the, the thing I optimize during test is the Z. So I have that way of finding Z. Or I can train an encoder simultaneously with the generator. And this is what bidirectional GAN does. And what's the advantage of this over the iterative process? Well, here we have one X and we directly go to a Z with one shot forward inference. Whereas in the other way, we had an iterative process that was slow and we can fall into local minima. So here we are training the thing, optimizing it jointly with G. So both are mapping the inverse of each other, let's say, and we can use the encoder later to extract the latent features that describe our data set, yeah? Remember what Z is, okay? Is as if I were telling you to paint some landscape and I was telling you paint green grass, a mountain in the background, some blue sky, and a kid running with a balloon. You would draw it in your way, your own way. I'm just giving you latent, high-level descriptions, and you make it pixels, okay? That is what Z is. It's not a direct relationship with pixels. It's an abstraction, and there's some process that you map as a neural network to the pixels, okay? But we like those abstractions. We want to know what Z is, okay? So this is a way to do it. And now, finally, some architectures um, very used in the GAN research. The very first one for image generation, everything began with image generation, okay? Um, so DC GAN, Deep Convolutional GAN, was the first architecture made to go from Z noise of 100 dimensions of Gaussian noise or uniform noise to an image of 64 times 64 pixels. Okay, so it's low resolution, but still was very successful, although many, many trials happened until they reached this architecture and they have lots of details in the paper that's referenced here on use relus here, leaky relus there, don't use max poolings, go for strided convolution, whatever, you know? Architecture changes that basically tried to tune everything such that things were not unstable. They didn't have spectral normalization. They didn't have uh, two time scale learning rates. They didn't have nowadays thing, which is two years afterwards now. So they did the very first research into how frustrated you would get to get a GAN work. Uh, but then people based on this architecture a lot to make them from text to images in DeepMind. This is Google DeepMind work, which is impressive. Uh, another work that appeared a few days or weeks later, I think, uh, same year, basically, uh, was doing the same, but with higher resolution by using uh, two generators and two discriminators uh, doing incremental tasks, let's say. Um, Basically, what I want to show you is they both went from text like this, so complicated, into images like this, which are quite realistic. In this case, it's 64 times 64. In this case, I, I think it's the double, 128 times 128. Because it's, this one is the small resolution, this again, this again with text encoder, and this one is an increment, oh no, 256, it's here. So this is an incremental version, okay? But still, they were doing so good job in 2016, two years after the first GAN paper, okay? In going now from, not from label to image, from text to image. So this small blue bird has a short pointy beak and brown on its wings. And you see different versions with different Z codes and the same code, deterministic code of the text and Z codes, four, five Z codes completely. They give you the same description, different birds doing that thing, okay? These are different ways for, to, to map that high level of abstraction from the deterministic code into reality, into pixels, yes? It's as if, it's a, as if I were telling you, this is the description, pain, pain me five situations like this, yeah? And you would add the random things that would make the thing still be like in the description, but with some slight differences, some nuances. Yeah, so um, what else? As I said, Z has some features, and in this case, so some features, some latent factors learned from the images. In this case, they trained, this is the DC GAN paper, the first one, 2015, okay? So um, they learned to map Z from two images. And in that process where there's no conditioning, what they are doing is they are checking. Once I learned to generate faces from a face data set that has glasses and women and men, and yeah, so um, they, iteratively look for, for each of these images, 
they iteratively look for the Z matching that image. And then they do arithmetics, basically, by saying, I have an image of a man with glasses and an image of a man without glasses, and I subtract the Zs for these two men, and I sum up an image of a woman, and I get many versions of a woman with glasses. If I get from that Z an image, and I get Z surrounding that first point. So the result of this arithmetic is, let's say, the central image, OK? But if I move in that Z space, I go in the surroundings of Z, I'm interpolating in that dimensional space, I get different versions of the same woman with uh, darker glasses or more smiley, things like this, yeah? But this is basically an origin point Z out of these arithmetics with half semantic meaning, like word embeddings. And then I can move in the neighborhood and discover new things. I can also do super resolution. And here something very important comes out in this example. I have an original image, a high resolution one with like good definition in the pixels, of course, and I decimate it too much. And I recover it with some big cubic interpolation, like just making some linear interpolation. Yeah, oh, no, sorry, big cubic, of course. But I mean, just some arithmetic between neighbor pixels, I mean. Um, so what we get is a blurry version. We, you all know what pixelated is when you decimate too much and you then recover. So SR ResNet is super resolution ResNet is about making a regression with the ResNet from the low resolution version to a high resolution one. But still, that's using a regression loss. So mean square error. So a distance metric in the pixel space. And here is the GAN result. So I don't know if. No, this is not something I can zoom into. But um, this is sharper. Well, you can see it in the hat, I guess. Um, so here is blurrier, and here is sharper. Yeah, here in the in the in the scarf, you can see it uh, in the texture of the hands, whatever. So the thing is, why guns generate sharper things? Here is the important thing, the important message, because this is a hypothetic space where I have pixel patches. Yes. The green, uh, sorry, the red ones are natural image possibilities. So for example, um, in the hat with all these textures, I would have many possible continuations for a patch of the textures, yes, in the hat. So here are the red squares. What is the blue one? The average of all them. And it turns out that when you train a regression, you get the average of all your predictions. So regression means give me the mean of all my possibilities as the best prediction. Because you're assuming that your output is a Gaussian distribution. Every pixel is Gaussian. So the best you can do is get the mean of that Gaussian. Okay? That is why you always get blurry effect if you use regression. And if you use a GAN, you get a plausible version. So you get a possibility in the middle of these red boxes, not the, not the average of them. Okay? This is the important message. Why? Because the generative model gives you a plausible version of reality. It doesn't give you an average of it. It doesn't give you the exact reality, but it is plausible. It is in the middle of the red pieces because it fits as a red piece. Yeah? Blue thing is not good. You don't want the average of it. You, why, why would you want a blurry face being the average of many faces? No. You want one face that's plausible. Yeah? This is what GANs do. Yeah. But they had many problems back in the first days. <laughs> Um, this is about generating ImageNet uh, docs, I think, or I don't know what this is, but you can see many eyes or many, yeah. They had like, okay, local structure, four eyes, something like that, but what is the global structure here? <laughs> we don't know. So when you went uh, good resolution, like 128, like 100 and 128, so double the DC GAN one, yeah. When you try to interpolate more and more, structure got lost globally, although, Textures locally look like animals and things like this. Well, self-attention GAN is from this year. Uh, Good fellow is one of the co-authors, work by Google. Uh, this work is by Google. And um, they basically use, I don't know if you've seen attention. Okay, you will see attention. Uh, and I don't know if you will see self-attention, but still, uh, this is not that, I mean, once you've seen attention, you can see what self-attention is. I will leave this here and you can get here as a reference afterwards okay uh, in the future I mean but this is a, cumber a bit cumbersome but once you know what attention is it's easy to get this thing but this is a cumbersome mechanism still uh, that 
got state-of-the-art results in May this year. May, okay? I will show you now something impressive. May this year. 128 times 128 image net generated images. Dogs look like dogs, fishes look like fishes, there are not 100 eyes, things like this, yeah? And you can see that for the first time they could generate very cumbersome image net samples looking realistically. This was the state of the art in May. Okay, we're in October, new state of the art at 512 times 512 with a similar architecture called Big Gun. Or lat, the paper is large scale training for guns, but anyway, they call it big gun. Okay, in the literature, um, would you tell this is fake? I don't know. This looks like my dog, actually. So the, it is. It does look like so. So it is quite impressive. This looks like the coffee you may drink and things like this. So uh, very impressive results. I'm not getting into the details on how they got this because we've just seen vanilla gun and there are some variations in the losses but things are getting that much realistic okay also we have works now to finish in speech uh, we've made this speech enhancement thing here going from noisy signals or destructed signals like someone that speaks with impairments like like if I lost my voice, things like this, because I got some laryngectomy, then it can uh, give you the pitch again and intonations and stuff. This is the work we did. So for example, yeah, we can, we can hear some sample here, because you cannot look into this, you have to listen to this. Oops. What do we want to do that for? 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 Sorry, it's, it's coupling and I have to down the volume here when I put the micro. So um, they studied how to make the 2D structure into 1D structure to make waveforms, yeah. And you can see, you can hear artifacts. So there are some intrinsic problems for these uh, decoder generative structures to generate uh, audible speech. Uh, and we are under the investigation on how to get rid of this and why this happens. Zero. One. Two. Three. Zero. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Very high dimensionality. So, so far, some questions for GAN's part. Mm -hmm. uh, any, if you're working with some GAN project and you have some doubts, some whatever, you can send me a mail about it and we can talk about it. There's no problem with it. Um, just have that as a reference. We'll have now 10, seven minutes break, well, eight minutes break. And we'll go to the second part, which is challenging, but nice. <laughs> Don't go. Yeah. <laughs>